I'm Dr. Lori Bettison Varga, President of the Natural History Museums of Los Angeles County. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's discussion, Does Power Dressing Have the Power to Change Politics? The fourth event of our series, When Women Vote. We are proud to be partnering with Socolo Public Square to present this series and today's conversation. To mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment, our curators have created a groundbreaking exhibition, Rise Up LA, that includes rare posters, photographs, oral histories, and much more. Please visit nhmlac.org to view the exhibit and learn about the rich history of women's movements in Los Angeles. Thank you again for joining us. You're in for a wonderful discussion. And now I'd like to introduce Moira Shoei from Sokolo. Thank you, Lori, and welcome to Zocalo Public Square, a creative unit of Arizona State University. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We are so proud to present this event as part of our series on when women vote with the Natural History Museum of LA County. Today's topic is, does power dressing have the power to change politics? If you were to pick a journalist who, who has kept a laser-like focus on the ethical practices of fashion, while also being extremely knowledgeable about the business side of the industry, you would choose Vanessa Friedman. Vanessa is the fashion director and chief fashion critic of the New York Times. Prior to that, she was the first ever fashion editor of the Financial Times. Her journalistic career has spanned publications such as InStyle UK, Vanity Fair, L and Vogue. Over to you, Vanessa. <laughs> I'm nervous, I don't know why. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today with a fascinating group of people to discuss the shifting relationship between political change and the fashion world, when designers and politicians alike are using fashion to make real political statements and the industry itself faces new demands to become more equitable and responsible. I also think this is a relationship that's only becoming more important as social media takes over the world and we increasingly communicate via image, which is the closest thing we have to a universal language. So to talk about this, I'm delighted to introduce our panel. Ibu Mohapatra, coming to us from New York, a fashion designer known for his eponymous label founded in 2008. Ibu grew up in India and moved to the US in 1996, and his work bridges both cultures. His latest collection was inspired by the revolutionary Indian artist, Amrita Shargil. You may recognize his work if you remember the print dress First Lady Michelle Obama wore on Jay Leno in 2012 or to arrive in India in uh, 2015. We also have Abrima Arwaya, the co-founder and president of Studio 189, who is actually joining us from Ghana. Studio 189 is a socially conscious fashion brand that promotes African and African inspired fashion and supports education, training and other empowerment initiatives. Abrima also started the Fashion Our Future campaign in 2020 using her work to encourage voting. Finally, we have Dr. Kimberly Crisman Campbell, who is in LA, lucky Kimberly, um, a fashion historian and public scholar with the National Endowment for the Humanities. She's also the founder of one of my favorite Twitter accounts, Worn on This Day, which she turned into a book, Worn on This Day, The Clothes That Made History. And she has contributed to The Atlantic, Politico, The Wall Street Journal, Ornament Magazine, and The Washington Post. So thanks everyone for speaking with me today. Um, I wanted to jump right in and uh, start with the, the elephant in the room, a question I get all the time, often from readers who are not necessarily happy with, um, with what I'm writing about fashion and politics. And they always say, why, why are you doing this? Why is it important to take up even one iota of our brain space thinking about this subject? So I wanna hear from all of you, but first um, I wanna start with Kimberly because I think you can give us some historical perspective on this one. I get those same complaints. Uh, why are you making fashion political? Well, fashion has always been political. We can go back to the French Revolution and, and much further back and look at examples of fashion making political statements. Fashion is a tool of communication, uh, whether we realize it or we want it to be communicating for us or not. And it is fun, it is frivolous, it is escapist, but it can also be very serious and very political. Yeah, I mean, to me, it goes all the way back to like Cleopatra and, and Queen Elizabeth and Queen Victoria. I mean, like you see it, you know, throughout history, really, you know, anyone in power has been using this tool. I mean, Abrima, how do you how do you feel about it? I, 
I think it is, but that's because I look at the supply chain, you know, and I think about all the people that are impacted within the supply chain from the clothes that we wear. And I feel that if you don't think it is, you're probably not looking at the supply chain and how it impacts the lives of people, whether it's about climate change or migration or a woman's right to work or, you know, poverty, uh, sexual harassment, right? I mean, in all ways, it, it impacts us. And I think um, someone like myself and also my business partner, Rosario, our families come from a tradition of seamstresses or people who are doing this kind of work. And I don't think we would be where we were if they didn't do what they did. And I, I do think it is, it, it provides opportunities and creates work for people, particularly women. I mean, Bibu, what about you? Did you come into this industry thinking it had a sort of political implication or were you just thinking, oh, I'm really gonna make beautiful dresses and then you realized it had all these other dimensions too? Um, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I was started making clothes when I was 12 years old and my mother taught me, a traditional Indian mother thought that I should learn how to sew, which, you know, it, Indian mothers would never allow a son to uh, learn how to sew. So she was sort of supporting me in the sense that it's okay to follow your passion and learn something that you, but I started economics and came here to do my master's, then I got my chance to. Uh, but yeah, for me, uh, getting into fashion was about creating, being creative and saying something different with my craft. But um, I have to say, um, you know, our leaders are supposed to be the change makers. And why do we only um, talk about fashion or clothing to establish their power or social standing. It can also be about where they stand. It's, it's their intent. That's what they, what they plan to talk about before they enter into a room. So um, I think fashion is, a, like Kimberly said, it's, it's a language, it's a tool, and more and more people are using it. I feel like we often talk about fashion, you know, when we're talking about politics in terms of a kind of uniform or armor, a, um, a shield that is worn or assumed when someone steps into a position of power. And people, I'm interested what, in, in that you said, like, it could also be something else, because I do feel like, particularly in the last, you know, couple of decades, you know, decade or two, our politicians, um, not just in the US, but, you know, in many countries around the world have become very cognizant of using clothing to also support a variety of positions, you know, whether it's to send messages, messages about inclusivity or, you know, economic power or, um, you know, used as sort of diplomatic tool to reach cross border. Yes, yes. I mean, do, do you think this is a change, Kimberly? I, I think you were absolutely right in saying it goes all the way back to Queen Elizabeth. And uh, it's something I think that maybe we associate with the royal family more than uh, the American political system, but it certainly works in the same way. Some people have called it Pantone politics. Uh, a great example would be uh, Pat Nixon wearing a red coat on the historic visit to China. Uh, this is a form of soft power, both economically and in the sense of image making and personal branding or political branding. Mm -hmm. And Abrima, do you think it's changed? Have you seen a change in how politicians you know, use clothing to talk about values? I think so. And I think it, because you were also saying around the world, I think it can also be used. I mean, I lived in Uganda for a while and right after I, I moved, they put a law in place. It had nothing to do with me, by the way, the way I phrased that. <laughs> but they, put a, they put a law in place saying um, any women who's wearing a short skirt, it was illegal and because it incites rape and they became, it was illegal, you know, and that, um, you know, if women were caught, sometimes they were, you know, be, it, terrible things could happen to them, you know? And, and so I, I do, I think that it's, it's being used in both directions, both in a positive way, but also, you know, in a negative way. I think you were talking about social media earlier. I think people are seeing how quickly social media is changing and also how like binary norms are changing and how everything is changing and trying to figure out the role of dress within that and what that means for cultural institutions including where I am right now, where there's a big conversation going on about LGBTQ. There's just a lot, I think it's a, it's a big moment right now. And I think that fashion is very much tied to that, yeah, also to political agendas. Mm -hmm. And Bibu, do you think that's uh, a uh, I, I, also, I also think a lot of things have changed. It's, it's uh, because our surroundings have changed also. I remember in the early 80s or late 70s, I was a kid. Uh, I remember when uh, Indira Gandhi was always elegantly dressed in a cotton sari, but she sort of exuded that power and a woman in power. And in a way, 
uh, if I look back, it was, it was, India was so much ahead of its time. But now I look at it, um, you know, there are massive women's issues that are out there. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think people are doing enough, but I think politicians in that country, especially, um, should be taking this, uh, uh, using this tool more and more to address those issues. And, uh, you know, uh, as you, I'm sure you have heard, um, it's more and more unsafe for, uh, uh, for women to travel in, uh, in night in a city like Delhi. So um, I would like to see more of our politicians there to, to speak to that and use uh, clothes as a tool. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned Indira Gandhi because, you know, we often talk about fashion and, and the idea of fashion and politics is falling too heavily on um, the shoulders of women and, you know, being a tool that's used to kind of demean women. On the other hand, you know, Narendra Modi was yes. he the very proud bearer of his own kurta, right? his Modi kurta. Um, yes. you know, so he certainly was comfortable using fashion to his own ends and using fashion to, you know, as a kind of branding exercise. I mean, do, do, you, do you think this is a misconception? I, I sort of do. You know, I think that there is a real kind of knee-jerk assumption that if you're talking about fashion in terms of a woman, it is being used to diminish her and that you don't talk about it in terms of men. In fact, I read about, you know, polit male politicians and the clothes they wear all the time and people just sort of ignore it because I think they're not particularly interested. <laughs> what, what do you, you know, what do you think, Vibhu? Um, I, I totally think because they just sort of reserve this category for women and uh, whether they, uh, they put, it, put them on a pedestal, but not for the, any real specific reason, just, just an object of beauty, but, uh, or demean them, like you said. But I think, I, I think men can also use that as a tool. And um, talking about Narendra Modi, uh, I don't think that jacket, he cannot own that because he, he tried to, but that was way before, like Nehru can say that, okay, that's the Nehru collar, Nehru jacket, but Modi ji, I, you know, he made it his look and he wears it all the time, but as did many uh, before him. So I think, we, you know, I don't think in this country, the politicians, the, the, uh, there's a gender inequality right there as far as using fashion as a platform. It's always expected of women. Oh, what is the first lady is wearing? And how about, how about the president, you know? Uh, I also think, I mean, that, 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 you know, women, I mean, certainly, you know, when you go back to Hillary Clinton, she was very, initially very defensive about anyone talking about her clothes. Then she kind of turned that on its head and became yes. very funny about her clothes. And suddenly, instead of being a weapon that could be used against her, it made her sort of human and accessible in a way she hadn't been before. So in some ways, I think women actually have a, an advantage if they can engage with it, if they're willing to engage with it. I mean, Kimberly, what, what do you see? Well, I, I think women have a lot more options and they also have a lot more opportunities to get it wrong. Unfortunately, they can't retreat into the sober anonymity of a three piece suit, um, a, a male uniform that's been around since 1666. Uh, women have a lot more freedom in some ways. I mean, for a man to sort of make a statement with his clothes, he has to really uh, do something odd like you know Jim Jordan never wearing a jacket or you know Pre President Biden with his aviators or maybe uh, Andrew Yang with his math pin that's about <laughs> as wild as it gets for men uh, whereas women the, every, every choice they make is going to be scrutinized and they have a lot more choices to make. I mean Abrima I feel like certainly in Africa there's more of a tradition in many countries of male politicians you know engaging with dress and the history of dress and you know what it signifies and you know they've been much more um, overt about it than you know than they have in other countries. What what do you think? I agree. I was just thinking about that when you guys were speaking. I, I think that I'm wondering if it's more of a Western issue. I, I don't actually know what that is. What because there are so many options. As you were speaking, I was thinking there are so many different you know items that you could wear, colors, patterns, yeah. prints. You know, like how did how did we get here for? women were boxed in in this way and men are boxed in in that way. Right. Because you're right, like I'm thinking about the president of Ghana, for example, he goes out of his way to wear local designers or to wear traditional prints. So you understand, you know, the traditions, et cetera. And he understands that it impacts the supply chain. 
and it's brightly colored and it kind of goes against the grain in terms of suiting and people do it all the time. So actually it's a really interesting topic. You know, where did, how did we get there? Um, so I, I don't actually, I don't know why we're there, but I, I do think it's, it's one of these issues that need to be broken. You know, like women should be allowed to not be forced and boxed into certain types of dress and be judged against it so harshly. But on the other hand, you know, why are men so boxed in on, on their clothing? It has nothing to do with their ability to run the country. You know, like there's so many great items they could be wearing. No, and I mean, certainly, you know, whether it's Justin Trudeau's socks or, you know, Kimberly, she said Biden's I, aviators. I mean, you know, there is a certain kind of little, little leeway um, for people to, to do this. Um, and, you know, and clearly we care because, you know, like when Obama wore that tan suit, you know, like the entire social media world went into meltdown. You know, they could not right. get over it. And people still <laughs> talk about it. Um, yes. You know, and... But it's interesting to talk about breaking out of boxes because before this all started and we were talking amongst ourselves, you know, we, one of the subjects that came up is the fact that, you know, first ladies have traditionally and female politicians in general, the few that, um, that we know about, you know, have been stuck into this box where you have to wear an American designer, right? That has always been the rule. It could be an expensive American designer, if you were Jackie Kennedy or Nancy Reagan, it could be a, um, a very, you know, economically frugal designer, if you're Rosalind Carter, um, and it was the recession, and you were trying to, you know, prove yourself to be one of the people, but, you know, it was always, always an American designer. And then came the Trump administration, and that norm was completely smashed. And I mean, Bibu, you know, as someone who was warned by the the Obama, by Michelle Obama before that, were you shocked by that? Were you surprised by it? Uh, I was, I was, but before that, <laughs> uh, there are so many shocking things were happening. So I was sort of not shocked by it, but, um, but I, you know, I was also a little bit disappointed that in the sense that that platform was not used. And I felt, in some cases, I felt a little bad for her that, no one really talked about it, only when the big faux pas are made. Um, but also, um, I think it was a missed opportunity uh, on, uh, on their part uh, uh, to, to send her as a, as, as, a, uh, as a spokesperson to talk about the issues that were important to them. But there lies the problem that there were not that many issues they cared about. So I think... Well, here's the question. Is it, is it their fault or was it the American fashion world's fault, because certainly during the um, during that election, you know, the fashion world was very vocally supportive, really for the first time vocally supportive of a presidential candidate, you know, when it came out very strongly in favor of Mrs. Clinton and, you know, and then very vocally upset about the yep. winner yep. of the election when, you know, numerous designers said they weren't going to dress the first lady. So maybe, you know, it was her, it was fair enough for her to move you know, offshore, if you would, even though her husband was saying we should all buy American. Um, I, 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 I think, sorry, sorry, I just wanted to say, like, I, I think if the effort was made to, to if they had reached out the appropriate channels uh, to designers, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, they would have, they would have lied. But, um, um, but some people, some designers in my community that uh, decided to not go there at all, and I respect that. Uh, but I don't think there was a process that was followed that is, a, that is sort of known for the White House, how to reach out and what were some of the protocols. You know, if, if you don't follow that, then if, if I'm a designer, I would be a little apprehensive about, okay, how do I, for what am I doing this for? Okay, we're going to come back to that one in a second. Kimberly, I wonder if you just put it in context, how actually surprising it was for Melania Trump to favor so many, you know, like very high-end European designers. Well, to me, someone who studied White House fashion history, it was shocking. And even more shocking was the fact that no one seemed to care. Um, it was 2011, not that long ago, when the CFDA issued a press release criticizing Michelle Obama for wearing an Alexander McQueen gown to a state dinner, uh, a non-American designer to a state dinner for the Chinese president. If it had been the British president, maybe that would have been okay. But th this is very recent history. And it also goes all the way back to uh, George Washington, who went to great lengths to secure American-made wool for his inaugural suit. And uh, we could 
look at other examples. Um, Carolyn Harrison, you know, her, her husband ran on an American first platform and uh, there was a, a huge, you know, media storm about her inaugural dress, which was designed by an American textile artist and woven in an American mill and then made up by an American designer. Uh, this was all part of the political propaganda machine. Uh, same thing with Alice Roosevelt, you know, Jackie Kennedy wore Chanel suits, that they were made in America, so it was okay. Um, this is a, a really long and, and uh, very important tradition that, that just sort of evaporated overnight. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Ibrima, do you think they missed, uh, missed opportunities by not using fashion as a sort of diplomatic tool? I mean, Melania Trump did a little bit on occasion, but I would say the majority of the time not. I, I mean, I do. I, I I was thinking also, you know, why did they just buy it? You know, like, why can't you just go in the store and buy it? I, I don't know why. She did. She did. She did. Buy did. It. But, why, no, but why not buy American? Like, she can go to a store and buy American designers, right? Like, I know she did sometimes, but why not use your platform to do that more often? And I'm, the times that I remember there were backlash that that uh, I don't care who you do or the Zara's coat yeah. that she wore, you know that that incident. You know I I do think it's a missed opportunity. I you know I don't know if all the designers would have wanted her to wear their items or not, but I don't know if that is the point. You know I think if you're investing in American design, then why not you know support financially and also, um, you know with your platform and her background as a you know supermodel and mm -hmm. and her voice. Why not support American designers? I do mm -hmm. think it's a Bibu, you said there were there were certain protocols that you should follow or ways to do things. Can you explain more about that? See, uh, you know, what I'm used to is, um, you know, I, I'm an immigrant. I, I came here and started my brand and um, I take great pride in uh, what we do here with my team and the fact that I actually um, am able to employ them and create a job and in my community. Um, I take great pride in it. And so I'm used to when, uh, I remember what were the protocols that were followed when um, the uh, Ms. Obama's team came to us and we, we, were, we dressed them and um, dressed her and had, we felt so proud of what we did. And um, I had a very different experience uh, with some of the outreaches and, uh, and I didn't think um, I could take that on um, just to be fair to myself and my team um, you know, without going into details, uh, that uh, it was just not practically feasible for me. And, uh, and if that's how they reached out to um, other American designers without purchasing them, then that's a, that's a big issue. And, uh, you know, then they're in their good rights to decline. Because, I mean, just purely logistically, and I think most people don't actually know this, but, I mean, clearly it's very hard for most first families to... Um, afford the amount of new clothes that they actually would need to do to wear, you know, an elaborate kind of new look every single time they appeared in public, or even the times they were appearing in public for major, you know, sort of ceremonial events like state dinners or State of the Union or, you know, inaugurations, all that. Like, it's a lot, it's a lot of clothes. And yes. particularly if you're, you know, dealing with designers like you, I mean, it's, you make beautiful, beautiful things, but they are not cheap. Um, exactly. And so, so the rule really is, right, that if, it's, if there's a dress or a, a suit worn to a state event or on behalf of the state, so like if you're on a visit to France or a visit to, yes. um, to China, the designer can donate that look to the National Archive or the Smithsonian, right? Yes, they can either invoice the State Department for that outfit because it's used for the state occasion, or they have the option of donating it to the archives and it stays there for good. And, um, and that's, what, um, um, that's what we did, the outfit that she wore to, uh, on her second state visit to India. And, um, and that, you know, that's, we, we definitely kept, every, everywhere that outfit, that dress was being sold at that point, it was gone. So we had just enough fabric left to create one so that I could keep it. Um, but yeah, that was, that's the protocol, but you, uh, either the first lady pays for it, if she's wearing it for her personal event or something, she pays for it, or if it's a state event, then the state department pays for it, or the designer decides to donate it. 
Right, which is actually, I think, a sort of good indication of how important clothing, what an important role clothes play in politics, because otherwise yeah, yeah, yeah. these institutions be, you know, they're, they're collecting it. It's part of history, right? It's part of the historical record. Yes, yes. Uh, that matters. Um, so let's, let's switch over a little bit to the current administration um, and what they represented. You know, Abrima, you, know, you actually were, you know, we're making clothes that were very much about getting out the vote and, you know, using fashion to kind of enfranchise the population. Did you feel like this election represented a change, represented something, you know, that really was different? Yeah, I did. I mean, I thought the inauguration was amazing. I was almost crying. <laughs> um, I loved watching, you know, I thought, first of all, the cast of characters, it was just kind of like everybody on stage. Um, and I, you know, I, lo I love seeing Sergio on stage, Sergio Hudson, Michelle Obama. I think she looked amazing. Um, I love seeing Pierre Moss, what he did, uh, what Kirby did, you know, and Jonathan Cohen, you know, like I just, these same, you know, some of these same people, we did a lot of conversations over the summer during BLM. I know we also spoke about Fashion on Future and I know where their hearts were and just to see, you know, them being able to participate in such a huge way and how it's impacted their businesses in such a huge way. I think it's really uplifting and encouraging. And um, I, I've seen a change, you know, I can see the business is changing. I mean, my, we had a small, tiny role, but you know, Rosario and Cory Booker were face masks that we made. And I immediately had like tons of orders, you know, from this one photo that circulated on the internet. Uh, but it, I can only imagine what kind of business they did. Um, so I just think, yes, I think there's been a huge shift and, you know, it's the most amount of, I think, designers of color that we've seen at inauguration and also maybe lesser known, lesser known designers. Um, it's been, I thought it was a huge shift. And also, sorry, Amanda, her yellow, I mean, her outfit, yes. just, she just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, in, in a funny way, I feel like the, the inauguration was the sort of the biggest red carpet event we've had you know, since, since lockdown, really, since the pandemic started, and people were so, like, laser focused on, you know, on what the major players were wearing, and, um, you know, and everyone really rose to the occasion, you know, whether it was the amount of purple that was on view, you know, or the designers that were chosen, I mean, clearly, you know, everyone was really thinking through the, the nuances of what they were using, you know, saying with their clothes, um, which is also, you know, why I've been a little surprised since then at how reticent this administration has been um, about talking about any of this. I mean, you know, Dr. Biden's office literally shut, shut down a reporter who was with them on one of her many trips because she's actually been very public and been moving around a lot and, um, and you know, making lots of speeches. And um, someone on her, you know, on her detail said, you know, what is she wearing or something? And they didn't say anything. They said, oh, you don't, you're not going to talk about this, are you? And her office was like, nope, we are not. Which seemed weird to me. I mean, Kimberly, yeah. what do you think that's about? It, it, it is weird, um, especially given that they have put in a lot of thought, clearly. And I think it is often uh, the job of the fashion press to kind of translate this language of fashion for the average American. I mean, obviously, uh, the first glance, you know, it does make a visual statement that everyone can appreciate, but there's often so much more nuance to it. You know, why the chunk color was chosen, who the designer is, that tells us a lot. And I think it's important to make those details public. Yeah, and she, I mean, she, both she and the president, I think, are very much wearing American designers. Um, interestingly, I think with the vice president, it switches because she really is wearing her what's in her closet. And <laughs> you know, she wasn't necessarily kind of amassing a wardrobe um, for this purpose. Right. You know, when she was a prosecutor or when she was um, in Congress. I mean, Vibu, what do you think Kamala Harris is, is sort of, how is she using her clothing? I, I, th I think, I hope, uh, I think she's just, easing into it. And I think, um, I think I've seen her in her um, uh, previous life that she's, you know, I've seen her wearing saris to, to, to you know, mm -hmm. celebrate Diwali. And uh, uh, I think she has it in, in her uh, and I think it will come out, but I really don't know as a whole um, why this uh, administration is not willing to talk about if they're making the effort, uh, why they're not, sort of validating it, that, uh, that, that uh, conscious choice they're making, because that inauguration 
as Abrima said, that and as you said, uh, Vanessa, that's the most awaited event because of because of it was sort of a um, we were ready for seeing something like that as a result of a, of, a, of an uh, of an election also. But why would they not talk about it? Because it's it validates more the designers and the uh, the collaborations that they have done and and their intent. So I think I I don't know about Dr. Biden's office, but I think we will see something uh, more shift with uh, our VP's office. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about I think Kamala Harris is you can see how deliberately she kind of chooses her moments when it yeah. comes to clothing that, you know, when she is knows that absolutely she is in a position where there are going to be millions of people watching her, you know, whether it was the, um, the night that they, you know, accepted their, that they had kind of won, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and, and she appeared in a white trouser right. suit, which she had never worn during the campaign up to that point, you know, that seemed truly a nod and a connection to, you know, both to Mrs. Clinton, to the suffragists, to that, you know, what has become a kind of right. accepted understanding of that, of that style, you know, or the inauguration when, as Rima said, she really wore, you know, so many small independent designers of color and, you know, and then wore purple. I mean, there was so much sort of statement making going on, you know, and then you see her, you know, at all the swearing in over the last, you know, the last couple of weeks where she really is just in her uniform of dark trouser suit, dark t-shirt under, you know, dark shell underneath and, um, and is very much about kind of the clothes disappear and the focus becomes, you know, on what her her words are and and what's going on. Um, and that, I wonder if that's a pattern you think we're going to keep seeing, Abrima. What do you think? Oh, I doubt it. I, you know, I I'm guessing that I, I I just I'm assuming that you know she's being judged so harshly in so many ways, or she will be, and that she probably I'm assuming wants to focus on the work, you know, and and not. Um, have this be, you know, what people are looking at her for, but I, I'm, I'm, I believe that as she moves into her role, um, we'll probably start to see, um, yes. you know, changes. Um, and I can understand that. I, I, she's coming with a lot of weight on her shoulders and a lot of people waiting for her to make a mistake. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, yeah. When I was actually surprised when they decided to do the Vogue cover right before the inauguration. Mm -hmm. That just seemed like a really unexpected choice as her first sort of ma major magazine profile slash cover um, after winning. What did you think about that? Did that make sense to you? What, what do you think they were thinking? I wasn't Me? surprised by it. She, she did do L first though, um, which was I think in, in many ways a better cover. Um, uh, one one thing though uh, for her that did get a lot of attention on the campaign trail, uh, both when she was a candidate and as a uh, vice presidential candidate, was her shoes, uh, her Converse yeah. Chuck Taylors, her Timberlands, and uh, it was very interesting that uh, they often got criticized as being you know too casual or too trendy or sometimes too quote unquote urban. Uh, but these are these are American legacy brands, and and they're comfortable and they're appropriate for somebody uh, in in that role and in that situation. Uh, so I, I think she does have some personality in her clothes and in, in her footwear. And I don't maybe it's because she was a lawyer. Her um, she's comfortable in a in a very you know plain uh, black suit. Uh, and and as she does more public events and more official events, I think we'll we'll see more of her personal style come through. I mean, magazines seem like a bit of a minefield for most female politicians, fashion magazines, I guess, in particular. You know, I remember when, um, or even not fashion magazines, when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was on the cover of Vanity Fair, and she got, you know, a lot of criticism on social media for the prices associated with the clothes she was in, even though she didn't actually own any of the clothes and the magazine had styled her. Um, and then, you know, uh, it was just, it was a sort of, you know, funny reaction. It makes sense that Kamala Harris often is always wearing her own clothes, right, in magazines. She doesn't let herself be put into, you know, kind of whatever is off, just come off the runway. Do you think, Abrima, what do you think of that choice? Well, I, I was just thinking about the Vogue cover, you know, about the reaction of social media. And the re there's, there's like these two different reactions. You know, and I, I think that one of the reasons people wanted to see her more, um, you know, like more done. It was it, because of the magnitude of that moment, you know, like uh, 
we can all be ourselves on a regular day. And that's, you know, but there's, we don't see black women on the cover. We don't see, you know, Southeast Asian women on the cover. Like it doesn't happen, you know, and this, that moment was about everybody, you know, it was like bigger than all of us. And it was a moment where she had this opportunity to use her platform and to use Vogue's platform to represent the best of all of us in every possible way. And, you know, I, I, I know that there's been good reasons as to why it was a great cover, but, you know, I think some of the feeling was like, you know, we could have done that. Like, why, why, why couldn't it be, you know, like, why couldn't it be more, you know, like, why couldn't it be, you know, you know, using the expertise of others that don't have maybe our personal expertise to make us the best version of who we are in, in a way that we don't get to do on a daily basis to, for other young women or young, you know, young boys, young men to be able to see that and see what can be possible using fashion as that vehicle of change. And, and that's where I also am on the side of the people who feel like, you know, it was, a, it fell a bit you know, just, it, it's a historical cover. It's the one that we're all gonna keep forever. And that's, you know, and, and it's almost like saying, again, it's not intentional, it's not a big critique, but it's almost saying, you know, that's that's as good as we're gonna get. You know, like that's as good, as, that's as far as we go. You know, like that's our best. And, and, and that's not her best, right? Like her best is so yeah. much more than that. That's almost like if you were in school and your teacher allowed you to give in like a decent paper or pushed you to do the best paper you could ever write. You know, like, do you know what I mean? Like, that's what it felt like. Okay, we're gonna talk for about 10 more minutes, everybody. And then we're gonna go straight to audience questions. So get ready. Um, I wanna just uh, pause for a second and see who, you know, who is the right model? You know, if Vice President Harris or, or any of the women who are now in Congress or the men, um, you know, or the president was looking to a kind of historic figure to sort of use as a role model for how to really take, you know, all the tools, this, this tool in particular um, at their disposal and make it as effective as possible. Who should they be thinking about? Kimberly, why don't you go first since? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, we could look at someone like Jackie Kennedy, Michelle Obama, even the Duchess of Cambridge, people who are constantly in the public eye and who, who very rarely, uh, get it wrong. But my my political fashion hero is uh, Shirley Chisholm, who was the first black woman elected to Congress and, and uh, who I believe ran for president as well. And she had such amazing style. She always looked uh, like herself, but also always looked like, you know, someone, someone who wanted to dress like. Um, I, I wish I knew more about uh, who was designing for her because she, she really uh, created a, a style that was very, very much herself, but also very attractive and very accessible and uh, very distinctive. And I, I, I think that's uh, part of part of the trick is is coming up with your your fashion brand, your consistent, uh, reliable, identifiable look, uh, rather than maybe jumping from designer to designer and and kind of trying a little bit of this and a little bit of that, uh, finding what works for you and really running with it. Yeah, Shirley Chisholm was really known for the sort of the prints and the colors, wasn't she? Is there she wore mm -hmm. a lot of dresses? Yeah, be, being very visible, what, I mean, uh, being the center of attention when you're when you're in the public eye is is a big deal. Uh, Ken, you know, Kennedy when she became first lady chose a an official designer, Oleg Cassini, so she would have a consistent and recognizable look. Um, she she mixed it up a little bit on other occasions, but but she valued the the consistency and sort of the recognizability of of having a distinctive style that that worked for her. Right, and certainly, I mean, if you look at politicians like Margaret Thatcher, she had a style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what, who's your, who do you think is the sort of the best political fashion role model for you? Uh, uh, for me, I, th I think uh, just, just as Kimberly mentioned, uh, um, that shift of having your own uh, designer who sort of tailored things to sort of suit your images from uh, that moment to the moment we had with Michelle Obama where she really democratized the, uh, the, the fashion that she brought and she uh, within that of course uh, uh, even if she wore a J. Crew or, or, or Tom Brown or um, things that she wore, they were also incredibly well tailored according to her measurements and uh, her wishes. But I think she did give a platform and a chance to, to a broad range of American designers. And, uh, uh, and she always kept it interesting. Um, 
and all along it uh, suited her and she got into a lot of hot waters for some of the choices she made. I remember that uh, for one of the state dinners, uh, um, she wore a uh, sort of a flame colored uh, McQueen dress and there were a lot of backlash about her that she didn't wear an American designer, but, but she did in her defense, she did wear a lot of mm. um, uh, American designers, but also she used that as an international, on, on the international platform, um, especially when she went to India wearing my outfit and that was all her plan. I didn't, I didn't even know if she was going to wear it. And I remember when, um, when they were leaving office the second time, I actually went through the New York Fashion Week schedule and sort of checked off the designer she had worn. And I think it was every single designer except maybe three. And then I called her style. So I called Meredith Coop. I think we can, we yes. have, we're allowed to say that now, right? We weren't yes. for all. Yeah, we can and say that. Said, and said, um, I was like, so is this an accident? And she was like, come, like, give me a break. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Um, Abrima, what, uh, who's your, who's your political fashion role model? I, it's the Obamas, the whole family. You know, I, first of all, I, I love Meredith Coop. She's the best. And I know she's extremely intentional with how she works. Um, and, uh, you know, I just love that in addition to the tailoring, which I fully agree with and the Democrats association, I just ruined that word. She, um, she put her whole soul into it, right? Like it, you, you could see her character and it's not easy to put your soul into your clothing in that kind of role. Like, you know, and she did it, you know, and the whole family, you know, the children were their age, you know, like, and they, they kind of broke what, you know, political children should look like, you know, and also maybe less to a lesser extent, also President Obama, like you could see those little moments uh, and I think that's really great because especially as a woman, I always find that, you know, it's, it's hard to find that balance. Sometimes it is hard to find that role model because you're still looking at people who maybe have come before you and you don't find enough, uh, enough examples of people who have been able to put their whole selves into their work, you know, and I think she found a way to do that, that maybe was criticized a lot, but eventually broke the mold. And I mean, she showed her shoulders, her hair, like she, you know, she, she played with everything. Uh, and it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that because of her and because of all of them, including the kids, you know, we're going to see, I don't know if it's this administration or the next four or eight years, but I, I believe that we're going to see, I mean, that, that's why you have an Amanda, you know, like I, I thought at the inauguration, she was wonderful. That's why you see someone like that who can wear yellow and a bright red, you know, and feel like I can look like myself and stand here and not try to reduce myself to this other person because I've had these types of role models that showed me that dress can be used, you know, in this kind of bigger way to highlight who I am. So she, I think it's, it's the other. She, she really redefined what it meant to wear American fashion. And if you look at the Clinton and the Bush administrations, there was a lot of the same kind of three designers. There was a lot of, you know, Bill Blass and Oscar de la Renta and maybe Jeffrey Bean and Galanos. And, and those were designers who were very cutting edge when they were young, but who had become sort of conservative, safe dresses for, you know, rich women of, of a certain age. And um, Michelle Obama completely turned that on her head. She worked with young designers, designers of color, a lot of... Uh, immigrants to America, and also American brands like J. Crew and Gap and even Target uh, that were very accessible to everyone, whereas an Oscar de la Renta dress is definitely not. You know, my favorite um, Michelle Obama story actually came from when she was on the campaign trail the very first time. And she, um, it was when she was going to do the, um, the Jay Leno, you know, do the Tonight Show. And it was right after Sarah Palin's wardrobe um, cost had been revealed, you know, what the RNC had paid for her makeover. And so, so Michelle Obama is going to go on tonight's show. She had an outfit um, from a designer that she was ready to wear. And the, the woman she was working with at the time said, oh, you can't, um, you can't, you can't wear that. They're going to ask you about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you should wear it. You should wear this. You should wear J. Crew. And she's like, no, no, no one's going to care what I'm wearing. You know, I like this. It's nice. It's cute. I want to wear it. And they're like, no, no, they're going to ask you. And just like, trust me on this one. So she, she, wore the, she wore the J. Crew. she sat down and literally the first thing that Jay Leno said to her was, so what are you wearing? Like $60,000, right? 
we said the J Crew, and you know, and the room loved it. Like she had the room, and I think it really, she understood in that moment how effective you you know fashion could be mm-hmm. as a as a sort of form of outreach, and it really did set the tone for you know the next eight years. Um, I just want to bring up one person I'd really like to hear your thoughts on before we go to audience, Nancy Pelosi. What do you think of her? Because she, to me, is a kind of master of, uh, of using dress. And you jewelry, know? her, her and um, um, Mesa Bay Republic pin, which is not only extremely large, but extremely aggressive and pointy looking. And she wears that a lot. You know, when she uh, had that famous moment with the sunglasses and the Max Mara coat, uh, the orange coat, a little bit after that, I got a, I think it was a, you know, a campaign letter or a fundraising letter from her. And she had actually turned that into a, a little fashion drawing on her stationery, and it was sort of a little retro 60s woman in a coat orange coat with with sunglasses and it was really adorable um, so she's very aware of how to leverage um her fashion and, and that kind of coverage into political power and it became a meme right i mean she, yeah. she like it, it ran and ran i mean abrima how how much do you think that like using fashion as a way to kind of create these viral moments. You know, what kind of a role does that play? I mean, she did it with the impeachment suit. Like, didn't she wear the same? (laughs) She's so so good at that. Um, No, I think think it does. I mean, Bernie did it with the mitts, uh, you know, uh, unintentionally. (laughs) Um, But I think think it does. And I think uh, Nancy understands that. And I think AOC understands that, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I think it has a huge role, but I, I like that she understands it. And I like that she makes these intentional uh, choices. Um, you know, I think sometimes they miss the mark. Like, I didn't really understand the Kente thing that much, but um, <laughs> but uh, I did really like the impeachment suit, so. All right, let's go um, to audience questions. So we've got a lot of them. Uh, there's clearly very heightened interest in this topic. Okay, so uh, do you think the rising movement for body positivity will make it more acceptable for politicians to dress more freely? Kimberly. That's a great question. Um, I I hope that politicians will be able to dress more freely regardless, Uh, but it was only in 2017 that women were allowed to wear sleeveless dresses in the House of Representatives, uh, which which is shocking to me. And it was only in um, the 90s that they were allowed to wear pants in the Senate. So uh, these are are very recent developments. I mean, I I think we we are all very impatient for more change, yet... uh, you know, change has been a long time coming and it's only in very recent, uh, relatively uh, recent times that we've seen this kind of change. So I may, long may it continue. Ibu, do you think people are gonna be able, women or men are gonna be able to dress more freely in the future? Well, uh, I, I certainly hope that, but you know, as we know, we are always, we're a little behind in um, in these kind of changes and, and actually such changes that are we're talking about now, whether it's, um, you know, issues with uh, race or, uh, um, or inequality or women's rights. We're, you know, it, it's very recent, the 60s, what was happening as far as race and women's issues are concerned. And it's, we're still debating this um, issue. So I think, yes, it will happen uh, freely. But I was pretty shocked to just what Kimberly said, 2017, on, uh, only in 2017, the Sleep, women were allowed to wear sleeveless uh, outfits. That's pretty shocking. Knowing that now, I think that might happen, but we have to wait. Um, Abrima, th- I think this one is for you because you had brought up Amanda Gorman. Um, could you talk about Amanda's yellow dress on the cover of Time as a political statement? Uh, what is the art community attempting to say about the Black Renaissance? Oh, wow. Uh, I think that we're in an incredible moment, you know, in terms of African American culture and in terms of African culture. And um, I, I think that Amanda is an incredible, it's like the ancestors touched it herself, touched herself. Um, but there was incredible, she was wearing on that same cover a jewelry designer that I really love called Kyrie. Uh, and he's been super active about like uh, pan African futurism and black futurism. And uh, I don't know, I think she's trying to basically tap into this moment. I think she's the future generation of this moment. And she has the power through her words to heighten this. And it's kind of like interwoven into her clothes. I love the bright colors that she's wearing. 
I think it says something about also our ability to kind of shine through. I know she wants to be president one day and I really hope she is. Um, but you know, I, I, I think that that time cover was incredible, but I love that there was an attention also not just to her clothing, but to her jewelry, you know, and, and we are in a movement. I think that it was pushed through uh, 2020 but we are in a, in a movement where I think a lot of people of color, a lot of marginalized communities um, are finding more and more their voice and also finding their allies and finding each other and trying to push these stories forward. And I think that she's a representative and I think she's a great one. Um, Kimberly, with styles like shoulder pads and trousers, to what extent are women co-opting the male physical appearance to create an image of greater authority and power? Yeah, this is something I've, I've been thinking about a lot. And uh, one real fashion moment that kind of stood out to me uh, recently was in the, the second impeachment trial and Stacey Plaskett's blue dress with the, the cape sleeves and what an impact that made. And uh, I think it really showed that we've maybe evolved beyond the idea that women have to dress like men to, to have power. Um, you know, for a long time, there were pantsuit nation and the uh, power suits with the big shoulder pads. And I think maybe for the younger generation of women who didn't grow up with second wave feminism um, and you know the, this idea that wearing pants might be controversial, uh, the idea that you can wear a dress and still look like uh, a, a powerful figure and a powerful leader uh, was very important. Um, okay, Bibu, how can women dress formally in a political context without compromising their personal style? You know, do, are, they, are we going to see a, a sort of a kind of parade of women in tuxedos or are you expecting something else? No, I, I think I think that's that's exactly what Kimberly was saying. Like, you know, we, you know, tailoring and having structured shoulders always sort of goes hand in hand with like power. You know, when you say power dressing, that means you have to have massive, strong shoulders. But I think I think that is being been rewritten now. I think as, as a woman, you can, you can walk into a room wearing completely different things uh, and nothing to do with traditional men's wear or, or, or pantsuit or anything. She could be as strong and as authoritative and exuding power in a beautifully tailored dress or two-piece outfit. Um, I think, I think uh, that is being evolved as we speak. Okay, Abrima, you actually started this whole conversation talking about the supply chain and the importance of, you know, of human rights and paying attention to the people who actually make clothes, not just the ones who are kind of ideating them or creating them, but, you know, actually physically putting them together. And um, one of the, the audience members asked, do you have ideas for what lawmakers could wear to promote the minimum wage for all? And, you know, to kind of raise awareness that way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think wearing, you know, not necessarily wearing, I, I don't know what they're wearing, but, you know, not necessarily fast fashion, let's just say, you know, like to make, making a conscious effort to wear, you know, to wear brands where you can trace their supply chain and being conscious about which brands you choose, you know, like whether it's brands that are producing in the garment district, whether it's brand, I mean, you know, which, whatever brand you like, but I think that as we said at the beginning, I think people, um, they underestimate the power of fashion and they don't give it enough credit, which is so strange to me, considering its size and its scale and it's the number two polluter in trillion dollar industry. Like, I don't understand how that can be possible, <laughs> but it is. And so if lawmakers, I think, actually paid more attention to their clothes, whether it's a tie or their suit or their turtleneck or their button down, you know, it's not about having a $9, I'm not saying it's what they're doing, but it's not about that. You know, it's about understanding how it's made and it would raise the minimum wage because there's no way you can make a shirt for $10 if you're actually paying people fairly. Even if you're not paying people well, you can't make a shirt for $10. <laughs> you know, like, so I think that, uh, I, I said actually, that's a good question. I think that if uh, people do care about raising the minimum wage, um, they should consider wearing clothes that are a little bit, you know, priced accordingly. Uh, and maybe turn the tag inside out and see how much things cost. I mean, yeah. actually, I think it would be an incredible opportunity if, you know, if someone said to President Biden or to Dr. Biden or to, you know, Vice President Harris, what are you wearing? And they took that moment and they said, well, it's a dress that was made by X, you know, in this factory 
these are the women who worked there, they're paid this, you know, like they could take that question, which is treated as if it's kind of there to be frivolous or demean them and make it an entire teachable moment about the supply chain and the people whose work goes into a garment. Absolutely. It would be kind of amazing. Absolutely. Saw... It's a... Sorry, sorry. No, I was going to say like, it's about, it's, and it's an educational moment also as consumers, I think, um, the, the responsibility lies on us to know about where it comes from. The fast fashion, as opposed to slow luxury, is, is, is something that we need to ask about. What is that artisan in India made this embroidery for me and why it is, you know, I would like my, I like to tell that story more and more as I'm talking about a piece of clothing. So um, I think it's important for them to trace back and have the knowledge and, uh, and if they're in that platform, if they say, like, like you said, Vanessa, if that happens, that will inspire their followers to also ask those questions before they pick up something in a store and flip the label and see where it's made. Abrima, you wanted to add something too? Oh, I was just going to say, I couldn't remember the name of this, the show, but I actually saw somebody do that really effectively in a movie. And um, she was a, a head of state and she didn't want, she didn't believe in fashion and she had to go to Italy. Anyway, they asked her what she wore and she broke down the whole outfit and she used her platform as a way to do that. And I think that would be so amazing. Or even if they had like blockchain or some kind of technology where you could actually start following what somebody was wearing and use that as a way to push legislation. That's great. You should do it. Yeah, or, you know, or even to like rewear something. So if you say, you know, like, where, where did you get that? You know, who made your jacket? And, you know, Dr. Ryan said, well, I, I bought it, you know, 15 years ago and I've worn it like six other times. And, you know, I just think all these things that we use to, that we think of as, you know, possible risks or things that could be detrimental to image actually can be completely flipped on their head and used as, you know, positive statements and statements to kind of really help an agenda move along. Right. You can say the same thing about sustainability as well as ethical manufacturing. Um, Michelle Obama is uh, often cited as the first lady, to, uh, the first first lady to wear vintage. And, you know, for those who maybe can't afford uh, an ethically made in the USA sustainable outfit, uh, wearing vintage, making your own clothes. Uh, I apologize to my, my fellow panelists who are fashion designers, but there, there are ways around this besides, you know, spending a lot of money on something that, that has been made to your high standards, uh, but also buy less, you know, buy that expensive thing and, and buy less of it, wear it a lot. I'd love to see Jill Biden wear her beautiful uh, flowered dress, uh, her Gabrielle Hurst dress again, because we didn't really get a good look at it at the inauguration celebration. So I hope she brings it out again. Okay. I, hope she buys, I hope she buys American designers as well, but it would be nice to see some of these things more than once. Yeah, this is a great, I think, point to end on. I think I'd love for each of you just to say, you know, what is the one thing that you really hope to see, um, whether for this, you know, this particular administration or any, any you know, politician um, in power, how would you like to see them using their clothes? Uh, Bibu, why don't you start? Um, I would like to see this, this administration or the continuing on uh, the future of our nation. I would like for them to use clothes as a vehicle, as a tool to sort of pay attention to and bring light to all the biases we have, racial or um, cultural or ethnic bias or gender bias, uh, really reiterate and use clothing as tools to bring that awareness to, um, to their immediate audience and their audience beyond. And uh, because sometimes I feel that they don't understand, our politicians may not fully understand their clout, uh, their power, their reach. Um, Michelle Obama did, and she knew how, wherever she was going, she was understanding. Her team was sort of trained to uh, prepare her for like that. So I hope that it will be, a, um, her formula would be followed, but there are a lot of issues we have on hand in our country, and uh, I think those could be addressed. Abrima? I agree. You know, I'd love to see the inauguration kind of all the time. I would love to see, yes. you know, um, that that level of consciousness and intentionality toward towards dress. Uh, you know, I'm sure it'll take time to get there, but to see that more, and also, 
to see, uh, I, I don't know if there's an area of the administration or, or something, but to see more weight given to the importance of the fashion industry uh, and uh, to see how that can be reflected both in terms of who wears it, but also being able to follow the journey of their clothes throughout the supply chain for sustainability reasons, I think it'd be really kind of critical. Kimberly? I would love to continue to discover new American designers, uh, both fashion and jewelry, and, and new models of dressing for women in power. Great. Well, listen, thank you guys all so much for this conversation. It has been such a pleasure. And thank you to Zocalo and to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County for presenting this conversation. You can find it on Zocalo's website tomorrow, along with short interviews with everyone who's here today. And thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Vanessa, Abrima, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.